This is Jeff Fisher. Uh, we're doing a presentation with Lynn and Alex, and we'll each be speaking our portion. Um, I'm going to introduce Sean Connery to introduce this first slide. <clears throat> Diabetic Retinopathy by Jeff, Lynn, and Alex. Just kidding. It's going to be me the rest of the time. Not as fun. So diabetic retinopathy is our subject. What is diabetic retinopathy? Um, there's a wide variety of definitions, especially when it comes down to how many types there are. But uh, generally, uh, diabetic retinopathy is caused by damage to the blood vessels of the retina. And that uh, is secondary um, from type 1 or type 2 diabetes. Uh, in general, over time, too much sugar uh, is in the blood, can lead to blockage. Uh, this is the diabetic portion. And what can happen is the tiny blood vessels uh, in the retina uh, cut off supply. And what sometimes happens is it gets more severe, the eye will grow new blood vessels, and um, those are the ones that are more likely to burst and rupture, allowing the blood to leak uh, and impairing the vision. Here's an anatomical view of diabetic retinopathy. And in there you can see uh, uh, a cut portion of the eye. And if you look at the abnormal blood vessels, uh, that those are the new blood vessels created from the blockage of the tiny blood vessels. So the new ones have grown and have burst and you see the blood leaking out into the eye. Again, there are, uh, depending on which references you want to draw from, um, some describe uh, uh, this in different types or different stages. But what I've found uh, more often than anything are the two separate stages or types called non proliferative or proliferative. And um, the difference between the two is proliferative is. Uh, DR that's been present for a longer period of time and creating more damage in the eye. And another uh, differentiating factor between the two is proliferative has the new blood vessels where non-proliferative proliferative, um, hasn't created the new blood vessels as of yet. Here we found, um, I, I went through, we went through a lot of video illustrations um, I found uh, what I felt like was the two best. There's two of them here. Uh, the first one is a short video clip uh, with no sound. Um, and then the second one is a 13 minute clip with sound that gives you a, a more in depth um, look at DR. We will not be watching this uh, during this presentation. Otherwise, uh, we'll be here for some time. Prevalence. How often does this happen? Well, believe it or not, it is the uh, most common um, eye disease in America in adults. Um, up to 45% of adults diagnosed with diabetes in the U.S. have some degree of DR. Uh, keep that in perspective, is 9.3% is of the American population is considered diabetic. Of that 9.3%, up to almost half of them um, will have some degree of diabetic retinopathy, which is really a high number. Worldwide, uh, the data was uh, vague at best in, in trying to figure this out, and, and a lot of that has to do with uh, people not understanding what to look for. Uh, you know, maybe it's small data samples from just small portions of different countries, uh, but the most reliable uh, sense that I've got was about 93 million people worldwide with DR and then uh, 17 million with proliferative DR. Here's a nice graph that I found um, that illustrates the prevalence. This is in the United States. And uh, as you can see, uh, looking quickly at the graph that uh, DR does increase, tend to increase with age, and it's more prevalent in the Hispanic population. Now, if you look at that, there is a resource link on this page, too. If you click on that, you're going to see some other types of graphs. Um, one that I think may be confusing is on another graph via the link, you will see that the overall numbers are higher in the white population, and that's only because there tend to be more Caucasians in the U.S. Um, than Hispanics. So don't when you look at the different graphs, uh, be sure to um, understand 
what data points are driving the graph. Screening for DR. So uh, we suspect that somebody maybe has DR. What are some things um, to look for? Um, do note that it's important um, that not everyone experiences symptoms until the advanced stages of this, so, which reinforces the um, the notion that you should have your eye screened at least once a year if you're at risk uh, more often. If it is detected early, vision loss can be prevented with proper management. Uh, the recommendations for screening for type 1 diabetics or annual for type 2 is short type 2 it's shortly after the diagnosis, and then every three months, uh, well, I'm sorry, uh, that yes, shortly after th uh, diagnosis with type 2 diabetes. If, if one is planning to become pregnant or is pregnant with diabetes, um, it's always best to have the dilated eye exam prior to conception uh, be screened early in the first trimester and then every three months until delivery. <laughs> If uh, there's a referral from the screening, the proper testing for a DR. So this is important to us if we accompany a family or a person for testing, just to have already a mind's eye of what they're going to go through before going, and um, which is good for counseling and building trust and helping keeping the um, the doctors on their toes too. So I'm not going to read through this uh, word for word for you. I'll let you just take a second to look at this slide. Okay, the gentleman in the picture there does look like the captain from Star Trek and the Next Generation, but I don't believe that's him. Okay, the effects on the visual system. So here we see a, a visual representation of what a person may be going through who has DR. On the right side, obviously, is a normal picture. And on the left, notice the, uh, the blocks, the dark spots, sometimes called floaters. And you also might notice on the upper right-hand side uh, a, a little bit of peripheral loss. Um, there is no uh, pattern when it comes to these black spots and floaters. It just depends where the blood vessels burst and how far the, the um, DR has progressed. Blurred vision is also a part of it. Dark streaks or a red film that blocks your vision. Cataracts and glaucoma, vision loss, and DR usually affects both eyes and not just one. Like most other visual impairments, treatment for diabetic retinopathy unfortunately doesn't always restore vision back to how it was originally. Often patients who receive the treatment say that you know, post-treatment they didn't really notice a difference in what they could actually see, but their vision stopped getting worse. Common treatments for diabetic retinopathy include corrective lenses in case of acuity loss, a form of laser treatment where a doctor will beam a finely focused laser right into the patient's eye, and he'll target abnormally large blood vessels in the eyes and shrink them down, which prevents macular swelling and prevents any discharge into the eye. Another common treatment is ocular injections. and what a doctor will do here is he'll take a drug, typically either a steroid or a different kind of drug designed to reduce the growth of blood vessels, and it'll be injected right into the eye with a very tiny needle. Out of the two, the steroid is the better way to go. It does the much better job preventing swelling. It does the much better job of reducing the, the blood vessels, but they also increase the risk of glaucoma and cataracts. The last real common form of treatment is a vitrectomy, and that's where a doctor is going to make a small incision, remove any scar tissue in the eye, any abnormal blood vessels, and any vitreous that's been clouded by blood or any other debris. If he removes any vitreous, it's replaced with saline. Now, ultimately, none of these are really great treatments because you're, you're cutting open the eye, you're blasting lasers into the eye, you're injecting things into the eye. Uh, disrupting that closed system. So really the best way to treat diabetic retinopathy is not to have it. Even in early stage diabetic retinopathy, the silver linings is that with preventative measures, 
about 90% of the people who are at risk can prevent its advancement entirely. In addition to regular follow-ups, those people who are at risk should maintain healthy levels and stay at a healthy weight. Insulin and blood pressure medication can help control these levels, but it's better to avoid dependency on the medication through regular exercise and eating a healthy diet. If those aren't enough to maintain a healthy level, you can supplement it with medication, but the less reliance on the medication, the better. If anyone at risk for diabetic retinopathy is smoking, they should stop. Or if children have parents who smoke, parents should do their best to reduce their child's exposure to secondhand smoke. If glucose levels aren't controlled, the risk of diabetic illness and vision loss increases greatly. So the impact of diabetic retinopathy is going to greatly vary from person to person and will also vary depending on what stage the diabetic retinopathy is in. A functional vision evaluation can be performed and it will tell you what a client's abilities are. And there's a lot of common issues that you'll see. For the sake of time, I'm gonna highlight some of the more interesting ones. Locating objects. I read a study put out by the University of Wisconsin and one of the people in the study said that they, they used to love cooking. That was, their, that was their favorite thing to do. After the onset of diabetic retinopathy, cooking went from being this great hobby, they'd cook for fun, to a skill where all of a sudden they couldn't find anything. If they dropped something, they didn't know where it was. If they picked up something, they weren't 100% sure what it was. A lot of the people commented that in cooking, any pleasure they had in the activity was completely removed just because it became so difficult to find objects. A lot of other people with diabetic retinopathy have extreme sensitivity to lighting. Some people will try to drive at night and find they can't because everything's just too dark to them. These same people may go out outside in the daytime and find that the sun is painfully blinding. A lot of people with diabetic retinopathy find that after the onset, they suddenly lose most of their social skills. When talking to somebody, they can't recognize subtle conversational cues. They have a lot of difficulty determining who people are based on their face, and they can't really go anywhere without having a ride. In the same study I mentioned before, one of the participants mentioned that once her professor saw her outdoors playing frisbee. And this professor immediately thought she was faking her visual impairment. The frisbee itself was high contrast. It was a bright red frisbee, um, and she could use the good portion of her field of vision to catch it and to throw it and play it. But the professor who saw that just immediately thought, oh, she's faking it, because here she is playing frisbee. A lot of people with diabetic retinopathy are going to have a lot of anxiety. They're going to become withdrawn. They're going to be socially isolated because of the onset of this. To further illustrate the impact of diabetic retinopathy, uh, I'm gonna go over a couple of common school accommodations. And a lot of these are going to be unique to each student, but it'll still give you an idea on what a lot of these kids might need. Uh, one of the most helpful Accommodations is typically preferential seating, but this has to be student driven because some kids are going to see or see much better in the front, some kids are going to see much better in the back, depending on what portion of their vision is affected. There isn't really a, a golden rule for diabetic retinopathy and seating. Some students may, may really benefit from assistive devices like large screens, magnifiers, um, something that can read to them. Other kids may not need that. Uh, some might have issues with glare, some have issues with things that aren't high contrast, other kids may not. In all kids that are diabetic though, they do need access to diabetic supplies, they need access to snacks and water, bathroom breaks, and they all really need leniency on time constraints in events of diabetic illness. If these kids can't check their levels, can't have a snack, they're going to have issues later in the day. So all the information I've just given you is, is great, but what does it mean for comms? And what does it mean for teachers? And what does it mean for caregivers? 
your clients, they might have peripheral field losses, some might have loss of acuity, some might have trouble with binocularity, and a few might have trouble with all three. You should get in the habit of bringing food and water along whenever you go anywhere for your clients. Because even though Billy was insistent that he wouldn't need food because he'll be fine, you don't want to have an issue where all of a sudden his levels are off and he's fainting on you. You also want to allot time for clients to stop during lessons so they can have a snack or they can check their levels, um, they can have a bathroom break, they can have water, whatever they need. Make sure you watch for fluctuations in the client's performance. Understand that sometimes these can be subtle cues that their levels are off and they need a break. Other times their levels can be fine and it's just an off day. You want to encourage every one of your clients to lead a healthy lifestyle. Um, you want them to eat well and have a good diet. You want them to be physically active. Uh, it's recommended that they spend at least two and a half hours doing something that's moderately strenuous a week. You want to foster independence, uh, encourage them that they, they can take care of themselves, encourage them that they can speak up for themselves. Uh, and when it's not possible for them to do so, you, you want to do your best to advocate for them without overstepping any boundaries. If you have an older client and they smoke, you want to see if you can try and discourage that smoking. If you yourself smoke, you don't want to smoke around the clients. Each and every one of the points I just detailed over the past two slides is important for every client you work with. But when you're working with diabetic populations, they become crucial practices. The brochure. Brochures can have several purposes. Some are purely educational, some encourage a call to action, while others connect people to information and organizations. My brochure is fairly balanced between these three aspects. I wanted to introduce basic concepts and terminology that people with the diagnosis of diabetic retinopathy or their families will hear. The back panel has a list of ways to care for yourself to help prevent diabetic retinopathy. I also listed websites for organizations and support groups. If I was designing a brochure for a particular area, I would include local organizations with phone numbers. Resources for parents. This list is more extensive than the one on the brochure. This could be printed up to be inserted into the brochure or used separately. If I was making this list for my locale, I would have included local resources with phone numbers and contact names if possible. I have several listings that are under the categories of information and education materials, support groups, and low vision resources. I have annotated most of the entries with information about what the website or group does particularly well. For example, one site had all of its educational materials in both English and Spanish. Case study. This is a fairly recent diagnosis for this woman, so there is not a long history. Her previous medical history that is significant to diabetic retinopathy is the use of steroids to treat lupus as a contributing factor to a type 2 diabetes diagnosis and hypertension. Linda had not seen an eye doctor for several years. She was unaware of her vision loss in her right eye until she had lost the majority of her field of vision. This is a good reminder about how easy it is for the brain to use the vision of the good eye in almost a flawless way. Linda was truly surprised when she closed her left eye and looked through her right eye, and she said it looked like it was looking down a tube. She has had both laser treatments and Avastin injections in her right eye. She reports that her doctor thinks they have stabilized her vision for now. She has started taking better care of herself by losing weight, keeping better track of her blood sugar and her blood pressure, 
in regular follow-ups with her ophthalmologist. 